Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of Coco's training. Uh, I wanted to say before I start, if you had any questions, and it looks like there's already a question. Uh, I, sorry, I, I probably missed that question in the Google Doc uh, about port performance portability. Uh, I'm not sure what specifically you're asking about uh, in, in, in this context, because Coco's is... Uh, like we would like to think of it as being performance portable and not just portable. I'm not sure if you're asking about the portability aspect or about performance portability aspect. If you're asking about portability aspect, then you can write a single source code that will run on most of the multi-core CPUs and all the GPUs with absolutely no change to your code, right? You just tell it to build, uh, and let's say if, if you're using NVIDIA GPUs, you tell it to build you know, build CUDA backend and build for like a specific hardware like Ampere or Pascal or or uh, the recently released Grace Hopper, right? Uh, if you're using CPUs, you can say build it with OpenMP backend or the Threads backend uh, and build it with Intel compiler, let's say, and maybe on a Haswell or a KNL or whatever, and that should work. So that's before, a portable. Before you continue, can I read the user's complete question that you can have more specific answers? Right. The okay. chat so, question I read is not complete. So the complete question in the Google Doc is, could you give an overview about performance portability aspects of Cocos? How do Cocos-based code benchmarks compare to native approaches using vendor-specific toolkits? Do you have real-world example code that runs on all three major vendor GPUs and show very similar performance? Please include in your discussion the required time and effort complexity to convert existing C++ and Fortran codes into C++ Cocos-based approach and any other considerations to maintain the same code base for different GPUs. Thanks. The long question. Okay, that's okay. So I understand what you mean. And okay, to give you, there are many real world examples where there's a single code base that runs on NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel GPUs, and these are production softwares, like LAMPS, for example, is one of the biggest examples, or Trillinos or E3SM, which have like thousands, like hundreds of thousands of lines of code uh, written in Cocos, single source code that runs on all three GPUs and CPUs, right, with, with absolutely no change to anything except the build. Uh, like, you know, you have to tell it to, to build on a particular hardware, right? Uh, and if you're talking about how it compares to the native backend, so we have done some studies, right? I mean, obviously the studies cannot be for everything. Like, let's say, for example, LAMPS that we just talked about. If you're using Cocos and you write your code in Cocos, you're not going to write like a CUDA version separately just to compare performance, right? I mean, that, that defeats the whole point of like, writing a portable code. But we have done some studies just to make you know a comparison. It's available and I will post those uh, like papers and links online. And the worst case scenario that we have seen is uh, maybe between five to 10% of performance degradation when you write like an equivalent CUDA code, right? Uh, and, I, and, and let me be very specific. I say equivalent CUDA code because you know, different people can write codes with different amount of expertise. So you cannot really make a, like, you know, exact comparison between the same code written by two different people. Uh, and if you're talking about comparing the performance that you achieve on NVIDIA versus AMD versus Intel between each other, that's not really a fair comparison. It's like comparing apples to oranges because you know, you there's completely different hardware, right? So you have to compare about what's the peak that you can reach on that hardware versus what's the peak that your code reaches, right? Like the roofline model, for example. Uh, and there have been studies on that too. Uh, but again, that's again, just a partial answer because the peak that your code reaches is really not uh, the whole uh, picture is not just about cocos, right? It's about like how you write the code, right? How your algorithm is like, like have you expressed enough parallelism in your in your code, and and so on. Like, not just I'm not saying it's a it's a 
uh, it's the fault of the programmer. I'm saying like some codes can extract more parallelism, whereas some can, you know, some are restricted in the amount of parallelism that can be extracted from it. Uh, I think the third part was uh, third part was how to integrate this in the existing C++ codes. And I would say it's fairly easy because everything is just C++ at the end of the day. You uh, you write your lambdas or your functors, and you you know you call Coco's parallel patterns on those functors or lambdas. The only thing that you have to manage is the data movement, right? That Bruno was talking about yesterday, like where your data is actually placed versus where you want to run your code. And this is not something specific to Coco's, right? If you want to make your C++ code, you know write it with CUDA, you have to do the data management too, right? Because even CUDA is not, unless you allocate the entire data in like a UVM space, which which technically works, uh, but of course there are performance considerations there. It will never be as performant as manual data management. Uh, uh, so data management is something that irrespective of the uh, framework that you use, you have to do it uh, because both CPUs and GPUs have two different memory spaces, so you have to move data from one to the other, and, and you know, uh, back and forth. Um, but other than that, uh, it's fairly easy to integrate into an existing C++ code. I I don't like, I don't see a reason why it would be any different than like you know writing an an additional kernel. If, you, if your code is Fortran or Python, and then you want to add Cocos to it, that might add a bit of complexity because then you have to provide hooks into the C++ kernels that Cocos uh, calls or Cocos you know, runs. But if it's an already existing C++ code, it's a fairly straightforward uh, word. Uh, did that answer all the points that you raised, Gokhan? Sorry, I, I, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. You can type if you don't want to talk. Um, type in the Zoom chat. Okay. Good enough for now. Appreciate any references. Yeah, I will put that in the Google Doc. I will put the papers that that are there, uh, and how the portability and performance portability aspects have been, um, uh, calculated and you know analyzed. Can I follow up on that question? Actually, with the. <clears throat> Another question. Sure, uh, yes. The um, you know, do you have to program from a, for the um, lowest common denominator between all the hardware because each hardware has its own, you know, optimization. Like for uh, Nvidia, you have tensor cores and things like that, but you right. don't have it the other hardware, so you can't really take advantage of tensor cores if you're going through Cocos or I mean, you can't mm -hmm. take advantage of tensor cores even if you write CUDA code. I mean the tensor cores are only available when you use libraries, CUDA libraries that use tensor cores, right? Right. So so if you use Cocos kernels or something like that and and you have written something that underneath will call can call, let's say can call CUDA libraries that use tensor codes, then that is what the Cocos framework would do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you would use... It would do Cocos. all the optimizations for you. The, 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 if you want to, like, we generally encourage you to write, to view your code in terms of parallel constructs and, mm -hmm. and don't view it in terms of like, okay, this is NVIDIA GPU that I'm running on my Cocos code. So I will do this, 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 this. You know, we, we want you to avoid that. We want you to think of it like in terms of portability and just express your parallelism through the Cocos interface. Mm -hmm. uh, we would do whatever optimizations we can on the underlying framework using, because we are ultimately we are using CUDA and CUDA libraries, right? Right, like, right. So we would do that. Uh, we would do that. And yeah, especially for CUDA, we have like, there's a lot of optimization effort that's already gone in uh, mm -hmm. from the Cocos team and from even like some of the optimizations are even from like the NVIDIA uh, developers themselves. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh -huh. Are there libraries to be linked at compile time? Well, okay, firstly, 
it is a header only library in the sense that you can just say include coco score you know blah 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 and then but when you're building it you have to build in a way that your code is linked uh, to the coco slip it it is a you have to link the libraries there is no other way unless you you have like a make file build system that builds the cocos and your app together at the same time uh, which every time you build it will just take a longer time right because you're building cocos every time but so you can do it like a header only but every time you build your app cocos files will also get compiled and built and linked against your application um yeah, if you use CMake, which is what most, which is what we prefer generally, and which is what I think most of the C++ community is going towards, uh, like, you know, having a CMake based build system for C++ codes, uh, you have to build Cocos first, and then just, you can point, it's just one line, you, uh, if you look at the, uh, the documentation, you can say, we say target link libraries Cocos with your app, and that should, uh, it should work fine. Any problem in making shared libraries using Cocos as the source? No, it is a shared library. I, I don't know what you mean. So it's essentially no the question is, uh, I am uh, building code that it's then used as a shared library, uh, for example, to call from Python. If I use, uh, if I uh, build that shared library object with Cocos, will they have any weird dependencies I have Worry no. about it will just no. work. It will just work. Okay. Um, any other questions? No other questions for now. Okay. So I'm not sure if anybody had, had time to go back and look at the exercises, but if you have some questions that you can ask that too now uh, or maybe later, right? Um, um okay then i will start okay let's hope that i don't mess up the sharing like yesterday okay does this is this good uh can everybody see the slides yeah yeah, yeah. yes sorry it did something stupid i don't know what i did is the sharing window closed? Did I stop the sharing? Yes. yes. Sorry. Just a minute. I think I did something really dumb. Just give me a minute. Um, yeah, is this good? Yes. Okay. Okay. So let me start uh, with the first talk uh, for the new user sessions on the second day of today's training. Um, the uh, uh, okay. So, <clears throat> as I was, so today we are going to learn about uh, two different concepts. One is how to extract parallelism from multidimensional loops. Rahul, can you also make the slides bigger without the left side? You can. I can. Mm -hmm. Is this better? Mm, not better. Now it's cut off the bottom. Uh, so, just a minute. Uh, How about now? This is good. You can I move up a little bit. Uh, Maybe a tiny bit cut off on the bottom, but there's also space on the top. How about this? More. 
I'm down. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. I think just a minute. I think there is a way to like avoid uh hide sidebar. Is this okay, yeah, this is bad. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's let's look at the cocoa slip. Okay, let's look at the string. Um, so today, as as I, as I was saying earlier, we will look at something like multi-dimensional loops. Uh, and following that, uh, Bruno will be talking about uh, advanced concept of hierarchical parallelism. Uh, and then we will look at like, you know some exercises. If we have more time, then we can probably discuss more on other topics or like any questions that you might have about the concepts or the exercises. But, Let's take that call when we reach there, right? So um, just to highlight that again, what we are presenting here is some is like a condensed version uh, and a mini version of of a longer version of the same tutorials available uh, online. Uh, today we'll be talking about like yesterday we talked about module one mod and module two. Today we'll be talking about module three and module four. Uh, <clears throat> uh, just FYI, we are not going to talk about data structures much. I will in, like give like a, a couple of lines of introduction of what what this has, and it's a very interesting concept. But I don't think we will have time to cover that. Uh, so, just to give you a summary of what we did yesterday, we learned about the Cocos ecosystem. Like, you no, know, what. What does Cocos provide to you apart from just the Cocos code library? There are kernels and there are MATLIBs. So basically everything that you would need to write, you know, and uh, a big optimized software package. The we have tools for debugging and auto-tuning, which which I think today the, the advanced users are actually going through the tools. You can the cool thing is that you can actually write your own tool that is optimized for your uh, application. Like you can write a tool that shows you, let's say. How many print apps there are there in your code, or something like that, right? You can write your own tool using using Cocos tools. Uh, that's I think is really cool. We looked at like simple uh, loop patterns, like you know parallel for and parallel reduce for like one D uh, range. Today we will extend that to to multiple ranges, but yesterday we just looked at the one D range uh, and like you know reductions and how you contribute the loop iterations. The fact that you know the the parameter that you pass to your um, Lambda the uh, is like you know is like the thread local parameter that's only available per thread and then you, all the results are then combined into the main final uh, result by cocos at the end. It's very similar to what CUDA does, right? We looked at uh, you know cocos views uh, that um, Bruno talked about. You know how they are these multi-dimensional arrays that. That are, that are actually like just one contiguous block of memory. Uh, then how to how to actually create views? You know how to give its dimensions at compile time or at runtime. How it is just like a shared pointer, which reference counted. Uh, you know, we talked about execution spaces, about which is essentially where your Cocos kernels would run. Right now, how you can control the execution space that you want based on like a template parameter that you pass to your policy. Uh, if you do not give an execution space, then Cocos would provide one that is named as the default execution space. The default execution space is decided based on what you compile your code for. So exa for example, if you compile your code for CUDA, then you, you have the default execution space is CUDA space. So all your kernels, if an execution space is not provided, would run on the, the NVIDIA GPU. If, if it is OpenMP, then the default execution space is OpenMP. Right, and then your kernels would run on CPUs. You can technically run. You can actually you can technically build your code for both uh, CUDA and OpenMP and serial at the same time. And in this case, uh, the default execution space goes through the uh, like uh, there is um, <clears throat> uh, like you know there is a hierarchy of what gets what has higher precedence and what has lower precedence. So if you build for a device and a, an OpenMP, the CPU OpenMP, then the device execution space gets the higher priority and that becomes a default execution space. So if you have CUDA and OpenMP, then you then the default execution space becomes CUDA space, right? Um, and then that is how you pass the default, like 
an example of how you pass the execution space to your policy. It's like a range policy. You say default execution space, and then you know it's iteration space and the counter. It's very similar to uh, like how you pass this to even a lambda. Then we talked about memory spaces. Like essentially, this is the abstraction of where your data would be placed. So execution space tells you where your kernels will run, and memory space tells you where your data will be placed. If a memory space is not provided, then the memory space of the default execution space becomes the default memory space. Right? Uh, we looked at how you can do deep copy to transfer you know, between uh, two different memory spaces. Uh, we also looked at layout, which I think is the heart of the performance portability part, not just the portability. You, yeah, you run like, you know, cached uh, layouts on CPUs and coalesced layouts on, on GPUs with the same code. If you, uh, and if, if this point has stuck to you, then I think that's great because this is the heart of why we, we say that uh, Cocos is performance portable and not just portable. No other framework provides you data abstractions that give you this kind of, you know, uh, freedom to choose your layout based on your underlying architecture. <clears throat> Some things that we didn't talk about, but probably just mentioned uh, uh, is that, and I think somebody even asked the questions about this, uh, like parallel reduce defaults to submission, right? Like if, if you do not give an operator uh, or a cocos reducer to say, okay, what kind of reduction you want, it will default to do like some reduction. Cocos reducers can be used to reduce over arbitrary options. Like you can write your own reducer basically, and you can say Cocos max, whatever, and that variable, right? Reduction over multiple values is also supported. Only reductions to scalar arguments are guaranteed to be synchronous. So what, like today we are going to learn about, mainly about in this session, we are going to learn about uh, multidimensional loops and how to parallelize like tightly nested loops using the MD range policy. The, the other two topics that, that we probably will, might not have the time to touch, but is available in the online lectures are the subviews and unmanaged views, which is essentially like how you can get a slice of a view, right? And um, that uh, <clears throat> this like that slice, Languages like Portran and Python already have this ability, like right, right, where you can get like a slice of your of your array. Uh, C plus plus does not. So subview gives you that that ability to like, slice your array. You you're not really creating any memory copy. You're, it will still be the same memory location, but it's just easier to manage, I guess. If if you just want to pass like a smaller sub view to a function or something like that, right? And then there is dual view, which is essentially just like a wrapper, like it's a higher order class. If, if you want to have like mirror views on host and device, you can use a single dual view and that will act, let you access like both like host versions and device versions uh, of the same thing. Uh, okay, so let's start with the concepts of like the MD range policy. Does anybody have any questions up till now? All right. Well, if you have, just stop me in the middle. Uh, so uh, what do we want you to learn with MD range policies is like how to actually use that, right? What is the syntax required and what are the optional settings? And then we will look at like a code example and, and like you have an exercise based on that. So consider like these nested loops, right? Which is a fairly common occurrence in like any software code you might have like here we are showing three nested loops, but you might have like you know two or six or whatever, right? Uh, up until now, whatever we have done, we have only showed you how to parallel how to parallelize the outer loop using Cocos. Like, so you would say like you know on the outer loop for the i, you would say Cocos parallel for with like you know its iteration index and whatever the policy and, and things like that, uh, and then you would stick the other two nested loops inside the parallel for. Now let's consider a scenario where both like where all three like N0, N1, and N2 are like 100, right? So just parallelizing the outer loop might be okay for CPUs, but on GPUs, it like 
like we saw yesterday, we need at least parallelism in the order of hundreds of thousands of you know iterations to make it worthwhile, right? Because that's the number of threads that or course we have there. Uh, so just N0 would not give you that, but N0, N1, and N2 will definitely give you that, that amount of uh, parallelism, right? And this is something that is even exposed in OpenMP. You, you have an OpenMP collapse clause where you, will, you can collapse uh, the N0, N1, and N2. It essentially just, like you can do this even by hand. You can just flatten out the three loops, you know, have like one major like, you know, super loop, which, which goes through N0, N1, N0 times N1 times N2 loops, uh, sorry, iterations. And, and then you can in, you can get your I, J, K and index based on like the division and the percentage op, uh, operations. And you can do this, right? Uh, this, and, and this is essentially what OpenMP would do. Uh, the thing that to note here is that OpenMP essentially changed the policy by adding the collapse clause now, right? It, it, has, it has said to, to, to not just look at N0, but look at N0 times N1 times N2. So it's essentially changing the policy. This is exactly, this is exactly what even COCOS does. We change the policy. Instead of range policy, we say it's MD range policy, which is basically multidimensional range policy. Then you tell the policy how many loops, uh, nested loops there are based on the rank parameter. You say MD range policy rank three, which means there are three nested loops, and then uh, in the uh, parameters you pass the you know the uh, the iteration ranges for each of these uh, these loops. Like you go from zero to n zero and zero to n one, and third one is zero to n two, right? And then consequently you also uh, increase the number uh, the index indexes that are passed to the lambda uh, or uh, which now basically are the iteration indexes for each of the loops, right? You know, I, J, and K. It's, it's pretty, uh, you would need I, J, and K, right? So you can parallelize anywhere between two and six dimensions uh, if, if in an MD range policy. The, to specify the dimensionality of the loop, you pass it through the rank parameter. The, uh, okay. the dimensions is a template, is a compile time parameter that tells you like, you know, what, like how many loop nested loops there are. The, okay. So you, uh, within that, you, you then give like a begin and end value uh, saying, you know, go from zero to N zero and so on. Then you have the in, uh, the functor at the lambda take the equivalent number of indexes to match the three loops. Uh, what you see is essentially just change in the policy, right? You're not actually changing the pattern. So you can do MD range policy even with parallel reduce because all you're changing is the policy and everything else remains the same, right? You are still just uh, contributing uh, it just still just like having like additional thread local argument here that gets accumulated in the final result. You can do uh, other reductions with this reducers, like you can do cocos sum, cocos min, cocos max, and everything that 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 can that you can do there. Uh, you can also use cocos views as a reduction argument uh, that is also valid. The one thing that someone who's familiar with like this kind of like nested loops has played around, uh, I, I would say would have played around with some like a tiling strategy, right? We generally do tiling to help the caching uh, uh, of our code. And while when you do an MD range policy, Cocos does some amount of caching for you, uh, sorry, some amount of tiling for you, but the heuristic might be off quite a number of times. The reason for that is because like it's very problem dependent, right? You, you cannot have like one heuristic that's, that can take care of like, you know, like 10 or 15 different problems. Uh, so it would be good of if you play around with, with the tiling options yourself. And for that, you can uh, provide your tiles as a third argument to the, uh, to the argument list, right? To the initializer list after your uh, starting and end of the iteration space, you can say, you know, 
the you can provide the tiling that you want in each dimension and cocos would tile that for you the uh, <clears throat> the one okay now let's look at how this would affect like let's say view like or accessing a view in terms of the data you know data access pattern let's say you have two views here right one is a which has a layout left uh, that means it's more like a column major thing uh, one is layout the second one b view is layout right which is a row major thing uh, and then you are using an md range policy to to assign values to it the, the views are all two dimensional, so you have two two loops. You know you can collapse them. Uh, use the MD range policy rank two, which is like two nested loops. Uh, the iteration ranges, and then you uh, you assign them, you initialize them with some values. So how would you make sure that you access the the nested MD range policy in the right uh, in the right uh, in the right iteration pattern, right? And Okay, right access pattern. So MD range provides you control over this. Like for the rank argument, you can apart from the number of ranks that you want you want to, you know, you want to have in your MD range policy, you can provide two other arguments that tells you how to iterate uh, within your uh, collapsed loops. Uh, one is iterate outer and iterate inner. So iterate outer basically tells you how to iterate between the index ranges and iterate inner tells you how to iterate be between the tiles, right? So there are, there are two, uh, two different things there. Okay. And the iteration patterns are pretty much the same that we have for views, like either iterate left, iterate right, or iterate default. Iterate default will give you the default iteration for that memory space, right? So if you have, for example, in, in, in the earlier example that you saw, like we have a view A, two-dimensional view with layout left, you can tell in your MD range policy that, you know, uh, collapse the two loops and then iterate left in, like, you know, for outer and inner, because that makes the most sense. And similarly for B, you would say iterate right and iterate right. If you do not provide these options, then the default one that is selected is, you know, the default one for that memory space. So, Either you do not provide the layouts for in both, like for the view and for the MD range policy, then it will be the same, uh, same iteration uh, uh, pattern uh, that will be followed because that will follow the default one. Or if you provide for one, make sure that uh, you don't need to provide for the other, uh, but at least be sure that you know it does the right thing in your scenario. Otherwise, we would lose the performance, right? Right, the default iteration patterns match the default memory layouts. Right. And with this, we come to the next exercise. Uh, I have some other things that I would like to talk about, like one more slide before, uh, but that can wait uh, because that has information that even pertains to the next topic that uh, Bruno would be uh, going over. Uh, let's say we gave you like, what was the time that we gave yesterday for exercise? 10 minutes, 10 minutes to, to look at your um, MD range uh, exercise. Like this is, um, um, this is in the same repo as the exercises that you saw yesterday and it's in the directory called MD range. So, you know, it's the same pattern, go to MD range, begin and you should, you should be able to look over the code. Hello. Does that sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Okay, let's let's con it's 9.45 PST. So let's say we we, we start at 9.55 with, with Bruno's talk. Uh, and if you have any questions in between, yeah, I'm, I'm here. You can ask or you can probably post in the chat. I don't know if you posted anything in the chat, but uh, does that sound good, Bruno, for you? Uh, yes. Yeah.
So just one thing, it was mentioned yesterday, but not explicitly stated on the slides, I think. Uh, all the uh, COCOS invocation are uh, asynchronous by default? Asynchronous, yes. Okay. And uh, if you don't put an explicit fence, uh, if I have two, concur uh, two parallel fours, one after another, there is no guarantee that the second one will not start before the first one finished, correct? Yes. Okay. It is also dependent, just to be more um, go in depth about this. Uh, it is also like slightly dependent on the backend. For example, if you look at the OpenMP target backend, which is essentially OpenMP for GPUs, we what we say is like every time you do a Cocos kernel, we, we you know we, we call the entire OpenMP uh, directives uh, that are necessary, you know, and then make all the things and put all the uh, lambda information inside that kernel and everything, and we stick a no wait uh, next to it, you know, which is technically supposed to not wait at the end of the you know the block because OpenMP by like is synchronous by default, right? Every parallel region is synchronous by default. We stick a no weight there, uh, but its implementation is again dependent on compiler, like LLVM, like upstream LLVM, and uh, some of the compilers that go that are based off LLVM uh, respect that, but some do not. So, just to be a little bit more. But if you choose like any like more mature backends like CUDA or HIP or SQL, that is you would that is essentially the behavior that you just mentioned. Right, it's just not guaranteed uh, that it's asynchronous, but it may be. So uh, you should expect, yeah, be, yeah. you should make sure that you actually do fences whenever. Yes, properly. yes. Uh, Raul, some people seems to have issue with the queue. Is it with the same the with the queue on Palmetto? Oh. Uh, the reservation does not work today. Oh, um, Helen, are you here? Okay, Helen should let me ask her. Uh... Oh, yeah, we thought today, uh, I mean, you can still log into the Perlmutter, right? That's not a problem. Because I think what happened was, hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not the one having issue. Uh, oh, right, 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 okay, okay. No, no, I, I don't know who's having the issues, but so the today's reservation actually, uh, starts at 10 a.m. PST, which is like in another 10 minutes. So we thought today's reservation would go from like one hour after the lectures start because we thought like the lectures would at least go for one hour. 
uh, and end one hour after the lectures end. So you will have like one extra hour at the end. Correct, Helen, uh, you're here, right? Yeah, I put that in the chat. Okay. The reservation information. Okay. And also put outside the reservation how you do that. Okay. Oh, is this in Google Doc? Okay. Oh, I don't know. There it is here. Uh, when maintaining code for different vendors, we should include x program with if dev program fragments, right? Mm, no, Gokhan. Uh, like that is like specifically adding something for a specific vendor GPU is something that we uh, we do not encourage. Uh, wh why would you want to do that? I mean, like. Is there a specific reason you're asking, or is it just like a question? Because any any Cocos pragma, uh, unless you put in like a, like let's say you put in a CUDA call, and then you can say yeah, if it's CUDA, then run this CUDA call or something like that. Unless you do that, every Cocos construct will run on every backend, uh, you know, using whatever the optimized way. To do that construct to run that construct under this uh, under that on that underlying framework i'm not sure uh, is that what you were asking uh, you can type in your response uh, also at compile time target specific gpu backend like in the current example yes you have to provide a backend otherwise the default backend would be like in serial uh, and along with the backend, it's always good to provide the architecture. Uh, like if you're using a CUDA backend, then say, you know, you're running this on like a Volta or an Ampere or a, or a Hopper or something like that, because then Cocos would optimize your code for that architecture. I think now, at least for the CUDA backend, we can auto select the architecture. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bruno. We can auto select the architecture. Uh, but for HIP, or and sickle that 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 is not yet there. No, no, you also sell auto select for hip. For hip too? No, no yeah, yeah, for yeah. hip, yes. But for CUDA, we can auto select the architecture, right? No, but for both hip and CUDA, we auto select. We check if there is a GPU. Oh, you auto select hip. for both. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so for hip and CUDA, both you can auto select the architecture, but you have to select the backend. Like the user has to say, I want to run on this backend. I don't know if I answered all your questions, Gokhan, but you can type more if you have any. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing um, and let have like one more minute in the 10 minutes so I'll, I'll let Bruno take over from here. 